There's a textbook they use to teach new monks in Thailand. And it's designed mainly for monks who are there only temporarily. The tradition is that young men are supposed to ordain for about three months at some time in their lives. And they go through the textbook during those three months. During the first two months, they're really thinking about being monks. And the third month, they're thinking about when they're going to disrobe and go back to being lay people. And so the textbook is designed to cover monkish issues for the first two months and then lay issues for the last. And one of the issues that's brought up is that the teaching that comes from that chant we just did just now about friends what true friends are and what false friends are. And I remember one of the young monks, as he was getting ready to disrobe, made the comment after reading this passage and after we discussed it. They looked over all the friends he'd left behind that he was going to be returning to, and he said none of them qualified as true friends. He thought they were his friends, but on reflection he realized that they weren't. The same principle applies to our friends inside, the thoughts that we travel around with. How many of them are your true friends? One good way to know is to get away from them for a while. It's one of the reasons we practice concentration. where for the time being you decide that you're not going to deal with them, you're not going to get involved with them. Think of concentration as like a temporary ordination. Get away from your family, you get away from your friends, and spend some time alone just to look at your life. Decide that when you go back to your friends who you really want to hang out with and who you want to avoid. This is one of the reasons why when we practice meditation, when we practice concentration, every thought that comes up that doesn't have to do with the breath is considered not a friend, somebody you don't want to hang out with, someone you want to avoid. It may seem like suppression or denial, but it's not. It's learning a skill. putting you in a position where you really can choose who you want to hang out with and who you want to just let go. Because many times thoughts come along and they're really compelling. And sometimes the most compelling ones are the ones you have to avoid the most. So you have to learn how to be really strict with yourself, skilled, with, skilled at sidestepping all the tricks that your thoughts may have to pull you in. So as you're staying here with the breath, be prepared that thoughts are going to come, and you don't want to go with them no matter what. If there's something really important you have to think about, wait for the last five minutes or so of the session. So that during the session, each time it comes up, you say, not now, we'll get to you later. And then be firm with yourself. Wait until later. Remind yourself that what, if it's something important you have to think it through, well, it's best to think it through when the mind is clear. So wait until you've had a good long hour just to be very still to get the mind in good shape. And then if you have to use it to think through some difficult problem, you'll be in proper shape to do it. And if you're in a hurry to rush into it when you're not ready, then whatever ideas you come up with are probably not going to be your best. This may seem like we're closing off the mind. 
and you've probably heard psychologists have said that people who deal in denial are just making themselves more and more stupid all the time. But we're not meditating here to make ourselves stupid. We're actually putting the mind in a position when it's very open and very still. So when the time comes to think, all sorts of possibilities will appear that wouldn't have appeared otherwise. It's because the quality of the concentration we're working on here is not a closed-down, clamped-down concentration. The Buddha described, describes right concentration as developing a sense of ease at some spot in the body and then needing that sense of ease in the sense that you would need a ball of dough to make bread. You need that sense of ease throughout the body. Now that's not a closed down, clamped down, one point of concentration. It's a very open concentration. It's centered. You've got to have your one spot. That's your primary focus. But once you've got that with a sense of ease, then you think of the ease spreading throughout the different parts of the body. You can think of it as honey spreading through the, all the open spaces in the body around any spots of tension or tightness. And it goes all the way out to the edge of the body, out to the pores. And then let that sense of ease just stay there. It'll start soaking into the spots of tension and loosening them up. And you have to watch out for the mind's tendency to shrink. So each time you breathe in, think whole body breathing in, whole body breathing out. Learn to get a sense of exactly how much pressure you have to put on that sense of ease in order to maintain it and not destroy it. If there's not enough pressure, it'll begin to dissipate. If there's too much, it tightens up. So this is something you have to learn through practice. Just keep at it again and again and again. And if the mind says, this is boring, remind yourself, this is taking you, going to take you someplace you've never been before. As we mentioned this morning, it takes you to something you've never reached, something you've never attained, something you've never known before. So whether it's fascinating in the present moment is not the issue. What you can do is try to make yourself fascinated with the whole issue of why. If you're putting too much pressure on it, why are you doing that? Or if you're putting too little, why are you doing that? Get interested in this, interested in this as a skill. As for the question of whether it's intelligent enough, say, remind yourself you don't have to worry about that right now. Don't identify with the, the voice in the mind that said, this is boring or this is not ingenious enough or whatever. And so people who think that they're clever, those are the ones who tend to get tripped up. It's the ones who realize they've got something to learn. Those are the ones who are going to learn something new. And this way you put yourself in a position where you're not really hungry for friends. That's when you can really choose who your true friends are or not. People who are hungry for friends will just pick up with anybody. Now, if there's a sense of ease, it comes from being alone here with the breath. A sense of fullness that comes with being alone with the breath. Then you come to the whole issue of choosing your friends from a position of strength. You're not choosing them out of desperation. You're choosing when you see there's actually some friends, in other words, friends of the mind, the thoughts in the mind, that really are helpful, that really will share in your sorrows and joys and point you to worthwhile things. Be really sympathetic, sympathetic to your true, true best interests.
at the same time, you can begin to see why you used to hang out with people who were really harmful to you. You see what their attraction was, but you also see where the drawbacks are. So you don't get fooled by the attraction. As the Buddha said, you also see the escape from them. How to avoid getting sucked in by those friends and how to get to a position ultimately where they have no attraction at all. But in the meantime, think of yourself as being in a position of seclusion, building up the strengths, building up the skills you're going to need so you really can deal with your friends when the time comes. Right now the time is to be quiet, to be alone, to be one with a breath. The Buddha describes a monk who's good at being secluded, that when people come and visit him, he talks with them only long enough to get them to go away. They'll have that same attitude, that same approach to thoughts that come into the mind. Get involved with them only enough to get them to go away. Whether that involves simply focusing on noticing that you've slipped off and coming back to the breath, or if you have to focus on the drawbacks of following those trains of thought, until you really decide you don't want to go there. Or simply ignoring the thought, if it's going to chatter away in your mind, think of it as a crazy person in the background chattering away, but you don't have to get involved. Or just relax around the thought. Or if it's really insistent, clench your teeth and push it out, whatever is necessary. But only whatever is necessary to get the thought to go away. Then you get back to the breath. Try to develop a taste for seclusion. That way, ultimately, you'll be in charge of your thoughts. You'll think the thoughts that you want to think, and you won't have to think the thoughts that you don't want to think. That's where you can keep yourself from getting hoodwinked by false friends.